May the Lord be with you. I'd like to welcome everyone this morning to a beautiful uh, sunny day. Uh, confirmation class is our liturgist this morning. Uh, you know, as usual, it's not a home tonight yet if we don't have a mistake in it. Uh, I was with the way Millie's been doing the uh, ushers and greeters and acolytes and things like that. Sometimes they roll over from week to week on some of those things and well, I got thinking this week, oh, all I got to change is the liturgist. And I didn't. So, <laughs> that's how it works out sometimes. Um, let's see, a few announcements for us this morning. Uh, start off with, Millie is in need of an usher for February. So if you would be willing to be an usher in February, please see Millie. And uh, hopefully I'll make sure I get the right name, names in there for that. Yeah, as that comes along. Uh, Stick supper sign-up sheets are out in the hallway out there, and uh, of course that's coming up in a couple of weeks. Other announcements, uh, today after church, church council, trustees, finance, you know, all these sort of committees, uh, there's a few items that need to be discussed and they'll meet here in the sanctuary after church today. And the youth will be having their first spaghetti luncheon of the season this uh, today. And uh, so as we get ready to get out of church this morning, there should be all kinds of interesting smells for you. Next Sunday is Girl Scout Sunday, February 10th. We will be having a Gideon speaker for you. That is our Gideon uh, Sunday this year. And uh, believe it or not, Ash Wednesday is just a couple of weeks away on Wednesday, February the 13th. So uh, the year is seeming to already start moving by fast. Um, one other announcement I have for us, uh, most are aware of it, uh, Tom Good passed away uh, Friday morning, and uh, there will be a visitation for him today from two to eight here at Road Burgers in town, and the service will be here tomorrow at 11 with visitation uh, from 10 to 11 beforehand. Are there any announcements I'm forgetting this morning? Okay, well, if not, then I will turn it over to uh, Wyatt for birthdays and anniversaries.
Urban to ages, urban to ages. 182 or 882 for the responsibility of the Apostle Street. I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in the conscious heart.
of their rest. Give beer to those who are perishing, wine to those who, who are in anguish. Let them drink and forget their poverty. And remember the misery no more. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. For the rest of, the, of all who are this. If you would at this time, let us turn to the backs of our multitudes for our prayer list. Would we have Georgia concerns that we'd like to share this morning? Or updates on ones who are on our prayer list? Go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Dearest Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you this day and we open our hearts to you. We give you praise for how you've been with us through this past week and we just give you thanks, Lord, for your promises to us that you will be with us through the coming year. We come before you, Lord, and we place these ones who are on our hearts and we place them in your hand. We ask, Lord, that you will watch over each of them that you will make their days good, that you will do all of those things that will allow them to get better and make their lives good. We especially bring Naomi and her family to you, Lord. We ask that you will be with them, that you will pour your grace, your peace, your comfort, and your strength out upon them as they go through these days with the passing of Tom. We just ask, Lord, that you will allow them to feel your presence, that you will allow them to know that they are in your hands every bit as much as Tom is, and that you are taking care of them. We pray, Lord, for our communities. We thank you for the safety and the security that is in our land. And we ask, Lord, that you will continue to move through our neighborhoods, that you will hover over our community, that you will keep it a good and safe place for our children, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren. We ask, Lord, that you will continue to work in this land. We ask that you will speak to our leaders, that you will speak to them directly, and that you will help them to hear your voice so that they will be willing to do your will and that they will be looking out for all of us. We pray, Lord, for those who are in the military. We thank you for them. We thank you for their sacrifice. And we thank you, Lord, for their willingness to do things to keep us safe and keep us free. We ask, Lord, that you will surround them with your shield of strength and protection, that you will watch over them everywhere they go, and that, Lord, you will bring them home safely to their families. We ask, Lord, that you will also be with those who don't come home safely to their families. We ask that you keep them wrapped in your hands. Those who need healing, we ask, Lord, that you will help them heal. Those who have healed, <coughs> Lord, we ask that you will be with them, that you will watch over their families that you will help their families to know that they are in the same hands that their loved ones are. We also pray, Lord, for those who are in the nursing homes. We ask that you will be with them, that you will watch over them and care for them, that you will make their days good, that you will put smiles upon their faces, and that you will place your joy in their hearts. We ask, Lord, for your continued blessings on all those who take care of them and all those who visit them. We ask, Lord, that you allow them to share your love that's in their hearts and that all may have good days. We thank you, Lord. We give you the praise and the glory and honor for how you've been with us and how your promises are that you will be with us still. We pray these things in your Son, Jesus' holy name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
through 25. Now when Jesus had heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken to the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and those who sat in the region in the shadow of death, light has dawned. For that, from that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And as he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. So his fame spread throughout all of Syria, and they brought to him all the sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, demonics, epileptics, paralytics, and he cured them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee to the capitalists, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Lord, bless these your holy words that we hear. Now Matthew's story here of telling about Jesus and the calling of the first disciple pretty much says when Jesus was walking along the shoreline one day, he came upon Peter and Andrew and said, Come follow me. He went down the shore a little bit more. He finds John and James and says, Come follow me. In both instances, they just do so. They get up, they leave their businesses, they leave their families, they leave the comfort of their homes, and they just get up and follow Jesus. Now, to us, that seems pretty strange, doesn't it? We do background checks on everyone anymore, don't we? Isn't that that wonderful little thing you can do on your computer every time your kid gets to go out on a date with someone and you put their name in and see if they're in any trouble for them? What would we do if we were just at our business, at our daily things, and somebody like Jesus, a strange holy man, walks up to us and says, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. We'd want to know all about him, wouldn't we? We've heard about the David Koresh's and the Charlie Mansons and all those other kind of looms that are out there. We want to see some credentials. Well, this story of Matthew Almost has it like Jesus said to them, like one of the mystics, you will follow me and hypnotize them. Or something like that, doesn't it? Almost reads like that. Because they do. They just get up and believe everything. But what Matthew doesn't tell you is, is what John tells you. The Gospel of John. First chapter, verses 35 through 42. Pretty amazing chapter there in John. It fills in the back story to Matthew. If you remember, the reason the Gospel of John was written was because John wanted to tell some of the other stories that were out there about Jesus. <coughs> that it wasn't just about all the little things that were mentioned in the main Gospels. Well, we find out from the Gospel of John and Andrew is one of those ones that John said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Andrew was one of those ones that said to Jesus, Where are you staying? Andrew was one of those ones that Jesus said, Well, why don't you just come and see? We also get from John that Andrew, after he met Jesus, he went to Peter and said, Hey, Peter, I just got to tell you, I found the Messiah. You've got to come and meet him. Same thing with Andrew. He was all 
also there at the original meeting. He went with them. And they went to a wedding where they saw some amazing things happen. Now, these men just got up and left their nets, left their families, left their jobs because they already heard about Jesus. They'd already even spent some time with him. And in fact, Andrew was already convinced that this was the Messiah. Peter, James, and John, well, they weren't quite as convinced yet, but they'd already seen some special things happen. And when they began to follow Jesus, it was because of who they thought Jesus was. Not because he had already started feeding them, not because he'd already started doing other things, but it's because they thought he was someone that was to come. So what does all this mean? What does it mean to them? What does it mean to us? How does this story affect us today? We hear a lot of people. We hear a lot about people having the right to make choices, don't we? We hear a lot about people trying to pursue their dreams, their aspirations, all those things that make life good. But we see in the world around us especially some of the outcomes of some of the choices that people make. And unfortunately, they aren't always good ones. But when we look at the lives of the disciples, we realize Jesus called them to new life just like he calls us to new life. We're not the same people that we were before we met Jesus. At least we shouldn't be. We find that in the Gospels, we find that some people go away from Jesus because, well, he asks too much of them. He does. He calls us to lead a new life. And in leading that new life, we find a whole new set of values and principles that we have to learn and invoke in everyday life. Or, well, there's just no difference in us than what we were before. None whatsoever. And there may not be much lasting influence of Christ. One of the things that was really so evident with the disciples as Jesus called each and every one of them, they were instantly thrust into a learning environment. Disciples were students of the rabbi or the teacher. And they were in school learning what God had in store for them and what God expected from those who would claim to be his followers. I ask my confirmation class sometimes, do you guys know what God expects of you? I ask us, do we know what God expects of us? Does it matter to us? Are we learning? Are we in school? They went where Jesus went. They listened to what Jesus preached and taught. Then they asked questions and they discussed what they had seen and heard. We see many a times where the disciples gather together and they speak about the things because, well, they're sure they can figure it out without Jesus' help. And then we see Jesus coming in and telling them, well, guys, I, I, I'm not sure you got that here or here. This is really what I meant by that. How much of the time do we spend in Bible study? How much of the time, you know, of how many of us actually read the chapter each day that's on our calendars that come home for, with our newsletters. How many of us are actually in small groups where we discuss the way that we've been walking with Jesus this week? Now, one of the things Jesus knew about these disciples as well as he knows about us, that he knew that they were hungry to learn. And that as he, as he called each and every one of them, that they would make up the nucleus of this church that was going to be founded. Now I ask us today, are we hungry to learn? Are we thirsty for the truth? Are we hungry for the word? And then I ask us, do we realize that we are the nucleus of the church that God builds here in McClure? That it is us. It's not the disciples anymore. They've already handed it on to someone who handed it on, who handed it on, who has handed it on to us. Jesus is the center of our universe, or should be. 
And we should be revolving around Him for those around us. I sometimes wonder what James and John and Andrew and Peter would think about us in our churches today. Would they see any commitment? Would they see any fire? I wonder what we would think of them if they showed up. Or even worse, what would we think of if Jesus? After all, Jesus wasn't like what we think of most of our pastors today. When we think of a pastor today, we want someone who always stays loving and kind. We want someone that when we're sick, they already know about it and they show up. We want someone who, want, who will preach and teach those things that we want to hear and in the ways and the manners that we want to hear it. It makes us feel good. And let's face it, we like feeling good and being comfortable. We don't like being put on the spot. But when we look at the history of the church, we find a bunch of people completely different. They went about their lives preaching and teaching what Jesus taught them. Sometimes that was pretty radical. Jesus was a radical. Don't ever forget about that. The religious elite, they complained about him incessantly. He ate with sinners. My goodness, he's got a tax collector as one of his disciples. He's an agent of Rome. He didn't follow all the rules. In fact, he didn't even always wash his hands when he, when he ate. Jesus did things differently than what was already happening. Now, these early followers of the man called Jesus would learn and grow in grace. They didn't have the whole story folded out before them so that they knew what Jesus had actually come to do. They had to walk with him and find out. We have the amazing advantage of the Bible. It is an amazing advantage that we have that even people who followed Jesus two, three, four hundred years ago didn't have. Do you realize that in our community, we have more Bibles in our homes than most countries have? I'm serious. We have more Bibles in our homes than most countries had. Because it wasn't for anybody but the church to share this knowledge with you. But Jesus came to share it with everyone. And with the disciples, everything that happened in their lives did so in the context of living their lives, of moving about the countryside, and yes, getting in the way of this established mores of their day, traveling with Jesus. Their day isn't that much different than ours. We just do things faster. We just know about things quicker. That's all it is. Something happens in California this morning. We find out about it uh, 10 minutes after it happened because they've got some camera there already. Something happened halfway around the world. We've already heard about it because it's already been put into the press machine and gotten out to us. Do you think the things that we say today or that we see today are that much different from the things that men and women used to see 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago? It's not. There are still wars. There are still rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes, volcanoes, violent storms, pestilence. We see the destruction and the death of the border right now in the comforts of our living room. They just heard about it as they went out and they traveled. There were lots of choices to make in that day, just as there are today. Same choices are out there. Slavery is still out there. Immorality is still out there. People taking the lives of others and just seeming to be happy then as it is and is now. In fact, rulers used to practice it a whole lot more openly. Because that's how they kept the people in control. These men and women of God, they were dedicated people who believed that they served the living God and made a difference in their world. That's why we exist. The United States exists because of 2,000 years of Christian activism. 
Because we thought that God was telling us the truth when he said we are all equally created in the image of God. That when we look at another human being's face, we see the image of God, our creator. And that each of those people have value. The United States was the culmination of that dream with his thought. Now, passion. These guys had passion. They would just wander into town and they'd just start talking to people about things. You know, uh, what do we have passion about today? What's your thing you're most passionate about, Leanne? One Direction? If you don't know who that is, that's some boy band, okay? What are you most passionate about, Lucas? What about you, Mark? What are you most passionate about? You can make a list, right? If we looked at your Facebook pages, what would be the things that would be on there? You don't have a Facebook page. Your mother may be smart. <laughs> what are the things that we will find in our likes if we look at our Facebook pages? Are they things about God or are they things about the world? We get excited about football teams, baseball teams, basketball teams, soccer teams, our high school sports, our college sports. All of those things we get excited about. We put on gear, we see people that color their faces and dress up in some of the most fanatical of ways, don't we? That's what fan means. It means a fanatic. Someone is off the deep end. Yes, Leanne, sometimes I think you're off the deep end with One Direction. But shouldn't that be our love of God? Where is our passion for God? Christian people today don't seem to get too excited about the gospel. Oh, I've got it for myself. That's good enough. I'm okay. The very idea of telling the world that there is a God who created you and loved you and has a special purpose for you scares most of us silly. Wouldn't want anything to do with it. Yet here we see in the story from Matthew today calling the first of his followers. And yet they leave everything they have ever known to go follow him. Now over the next 30 to 60 years, Actually, some of them didn't even have 30 years. Some of them were starting to be martyred within years of Jesus' death. We see that over the next few years that they all died. All but John are martyred for their, for their faith. Peter executed on the cross, upside down. We find both Bartholomew. He was flayed alive. Some of them were burned. Some of them were, were ripped apart. The passion went on them. As Peter was on that cross upside down, Peter preached. He told people about the living God and that he wasn't concerned with what was happening to his mortal body because he knew that something better was coming. He knew that he was following the calling that God had put on his life. Passion went on. Not only in the accounts of what we have in the Bible, but I've got a whole book. Actually, I've got a few different books. But the most famous one is Fox's Book of Martyrs. It shows that how throughout the years, even through to today, that people are being persecuted for their faith, that people are being put to death for their faith. If you were a Muslim and you convert to Christianity, the least that you can expect to happen to you is to be put in prison. In most cases, you will be executed by your village so that you don't take anyone else with you. They knew the truth. Just as people know the truth today that are languishing in prisons, and they refused to give up on that truth, they decided they would stay true throughout all of their days. So what does this mean for you and me today? Well, that's the question, isn't it? Well, what does it mean for us? I have to 
admit, if I'm more excited about the Buckeyes than I am about Jesus Christ, my relationship with Jesus is not where it should be. And I am a Buckeye fan. <laughs> Thanks again. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> You guys should be more fanatical for Jesus. Not in a crazy way, but in a loving way. It means I should be willing to say that I am His any time, any place, anywhere. It should mean that I am willing to say I am willing to love anyone, any time, any place, anywhere. It should make me willing to say that I will always make the choice for Jesus. We do. Do we just do it when it's convenient? If it would cost us our job, would we make that choice for Jesus? If it cost us our family, would we make that choice for Jesus? If it cost us our money, would we make that choice for Jesus? Or even more, if we were like one of those disciples. One of the many throughout the years that was called to give their life because of their faith in Jesus. What would we do? Would we be willing to give of ourselves? Would we be willing like these ones who gave up all that they had known to follow Jesus? Now there are stories in the Bible that says some weren't wrong. Remember the rich young ruler that came to Jesus and said, What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, obey the commandments. Love God. Love your fellow man. He says, oh, I've done that since my birth. And Jesus says, well, you do have one more thing you should do. Sell all you have and give it to the poor. And then come follow me. This young man went away sad. Because he wasn't willing to give up those things that seemed more important. Yet God continues the invitation today. He continues to say, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He says it to each of us. He says it to our hearts. He says it to our minds. Because we know good and well when we, when we believe with our minds and live it out through our actions, which is our hearts, then we're actually where we're supposed to be. The question today is, difference does it make to me that I follow Christ? And what difference does it make in someone else's life? Just because we're here gathered this morning, we see the difference that it made in the lives of the Peter and the Andrew and the James and the John. They were called and we're called just as they are. Come, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Those are the words of Jesus. It's not just come follow me, flee the wrath of come. Good incentive, don't get me wrong. But that starts us on the path. And once we start walking, he has many places he'd like to take us. If we're only willing to go. We join me in prayer. Dearest Heavenly Father, we know, Lord, that we're not always willing to risk job, family, money, life. I sometimes it seems like we're not really willing to risk much for you at all. And yet you risked it all for us. To the point of death. And then you showed us that our faith in you is good faith. That it's true faith. That it is real faith. Because you rose from the dead. Your tomb is empty. And we have love. Help us, Lord, to be your followers. Help us to follow you with all that we are, not just the limited pieces here and there that we're willing to give you. Help us to love as you love. And especially help us to love you as you love us. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. At this time, let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God.
gifts and tithes and offerings, Lord, we ask that you use them, that you bless them and multiply them, that you make lives different, that you allow more people to come follow you and become fishers of men. We thank you that you let us be a part of what you're doing, and we thank you most of all for what you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.
Be with you all now and 